Three months after the tunnel opened for freight traffic, and the first fatal accident happened inside the tunnel. Following a train break in the tunnel, conductor George Hawthorne and brakeman Joseph Whelan were overcome by fumes and Hawthorne died. The breaking of couplers in the tunnel became so commonplace that more fatal accidents were inevitable. In the four years ending the 30th of June, 1899, for example, when nearly 16,000 trains traversed the tunnel, each year a total of 278 trains broke apart in the tunnel. That's roughly 70 per year. So why were these trains breaking apart? Well, they didn't have the efficient couplers that they do today. They had what they called a link and pin coupler. And all this was was a couple oversized chain links. You can see uh, in between there that one link and two pins that held them in place. Archer and historian T.J. Gaffney, who has authored two fine historical books of portraiture, and one portraiture in between 1880 and 1960 in postcards. And as you know, postcards are always near and dear to my heart. And then, of course, uh, anything you want to know about railroading in the thumb area, and we're afraid to ask. Uh, rails around the thumb will answer your questions. Uh, two fine books if you haven't had the chance. You should uh, take a gander at them. You can purchase these in the bookstores or I think there's a couple places in Port Huron locally where you can also purchase them. Anyway, I said all that to say this. I came across uh, several articles that TJ uh, wrote for the Lakeshore Guardian. And they give us a real insight, uh, at least from a real worker's perspective of uh, what happened during those disasters in the tunnel? I'll be reading some of these excerpts and I think you'll enjoy them. Regarding the Lincoln pin couplers, he says this, The dangerous nature of this connection was obvious, as countless individuals working as the brakemen, whose job it was to couple these cars, were maimed or injured trying to connect via this crude method. A grisly joke of the day was that one could tell how long a brakeman worked for the railroad by how many digits were missing usually one for every five years of service. I think by looking at this photograph here that we can see why it would be quite easy to lose some fingers. The problem with the trains coming apart inside the tunnel uh, was not only due to the fact that uh, they had the Lincoln pin system, but also due to the angle of the grade going in and coming out of it. As the train rolled down into the tunnel, it had a tendency to bunch up. And as it began to ascend out of the tunnel, the strain from the slack running back out would often break the brittle iron links. And if you had an engineer who had a heavy hand on the throttle, it was almost a foregone conclusion. Five years after the first disaster, a second one occurred on November 28, 1897. More cars came on coupled and more people were dead. Three men were asphyxiated by the fumes in that tunnel that night. At the inquest after the second incident, Chief Engineer of Tunnel Construction, Joseph Hobson, noted that the Grand Trunk Railroad was looking at the possibility of using electrical engines in the tunnel, something briefly considered after the first asphyxiation, but considered too experimental and expensive at the time. You have to remember that this was just a few years after the invention of the light bulb, and a battle still raged about the use of AC versus DC power for electrical transmission. It would take seven years and another serious incident involving an even greater loss of life to make the Grand Trunk Railroad change its mind. I think this postcard uh, illustrates better than any picture I know of of the fumes that are in that tunnel that are deadly to the workers. And here's that train coming out of the tunnel surrounded by that white cloud of fumes. Now that's fine if you're going 30 miles an hour through the tunnel, but if you're stopped there your cars have come out, or you're walking in trying to couple the cars again, and all that is still in there. That's a serious problem. Not only for those in distress, but also the rescue workers that go in after them. The third and worse accident happened on the 9th of October, 1904, and produced six deaths, including two brakemen, two conductors, the locomotive engineer, and the superintendent of the Sarnia and Port Huron terminals, Alexander S. Begg. Got an article, a newspaper article here that tells about uh, what happened that day. But, uh, and you can read this at your leisure. I'll slowly uh, pan through it. But uh, 
I want to relate the story as how uh, T.J. Gaffney tells it, which I think is very good. As October 9, 1904 dawned, it seemed like a typically sleepy and uneventful Sunday was in store for the crew of Locomotive 1301. It entered the tunnel with 16 cars of coal and a caboose, but engineer John Coleman and fireman Fred Forrester soon found that only six cars were still attached as they reached the crest of the hill in Sarnia. Following the ruse instituted after the 1897 tragedy, the engine crew took the cars into the yard and deposited them, hopefully giving some time for the spoke to clear out. They then backed the engine down into the tunnel. Due to the broken coupler, the crew had to connect the cars inside the tunnel to the engine with a chain. They then uncoupled three cars, feeling that this was all the chain could handle, and removed them from the tunnel depositing them with the others in the yard. It was after a third return into the tunnel uh, to recover the remaining seven coal cars in the caboose that they sealed their fate as the smoke and fumes were beginning to build to increasingly dangerous levels. Realizing the situation, the crew tried to get the remaining cars out with the chain. In order to do so, Engineer Coleman had to pour on the steam and became overcome by the smoke and fumes in doing so. Meanwhile, brakeman Alfred Short, tired of waiting in the stifling heat of the closed caboose, decided to walk out to the American side. He made it, became severely affected by the smoke and fumes. He had just enough sense to give the alarm, notifying Alexander S. Begg, superintendent of terminals. Begg ran down and proceeded into the tunnel. This, sadly, was the last time he was ever seen alive. What was a horrible situation quickly became worse. Like the stories of a fellow farmer who have gone into barn silos in the hopes of saving a farmer being overcome themselves. The would-be rescuers on both sides began to fall like dominoes. When the train failed to reappear from the tunnel after the third attempt to couple onto the train, the men on the Sarnia side also realized something had gone horribly wrong. Conductors Charles Fisher and Richard Tinsley, along with brakeman James Hamilton, Walter Hahn, Alex Forbes, Daniel Gillies and Thomas McGrath all entered the tunnel in an attempt to save the crew as well. Tinsley and McGrath were quickly overcome by the fumes and barely made it out of the tunnel. A second team, consisting of conductor Porter, Franklin McKee, John Blake, and John Arbaugh, entered the tunnel on foot and were finally able to reach the engine. They found engineer Coleman dead in the cab with his hand still under control. The fireman was found unconscious with his head in the tender tank. The relatively fresh air in there had obviously saved his life. The crew sadly found the bodies of would-be rescuers, Gillies and McGrath, next to the engine. Gillies and McGrath's body were placed on the locomotive, and it was run out of the tunnel. When they emerged, much to their surprise, they had found that the train had been successfully reattached. Sadly, the bodies of Conductor Tinsley and Simpson, who had remained in the caboose, were soon found as well. One of the survivors of that rescue attempt uh, was Alexander Forbes. And uh, this uh, photograph that we are looking at here on the Sarnia side of the tunnel, you see the pump house and you see the man there beside it. That is Alexander Forbes. He obtained employment on the construction of the St. Clair Tunnel where he continued until 1892, a year after the tunnel was finished. Then he entered the employ of the Grand Trunk Railway and for 39 years he was employed as a pumpman on the tunnel and retired in 1926 and he was a pumpman in that very house that you're looking at that is the pump house for the Sarnia side of the tunnel and here you can see him inside the pump house for his participation in that rescue uh, he was awarded the Royal Humane Society Medal for bravery along with four other people I believe this photograph is showing both sides of the medal I've been in contact with Alex Forbes' youngest granddaughter, uh, Dorothy, and uh, she sent me this picture. And in this photograph, uh, you can see Alex Forbes standing there by the bicycle. And that baby is actually Dorothy's mother. And I asked Dorothy if there's any particular uh, remembrance of the incident he may have talked to her about. And she said no, but her fondest memory of her grandfather was going across on the ferry to Port Jern. It was always a big day for them when they did that. 
Yeah, I can understand that. It was always a big day for me when I went across the ferry with my dad. And it was a fun time. On a side note, this house was once used for distributing payroll to the tunnel employees. The workers would go right up on the front porch and they would distribute the pay uh, right through that front window there. On another side note, uh, in this other picture that Dorothy shared with me of the pump house where her grandfather worked, there was this sign hanging up. Uh, and I looked and magnified it and I couldn't understand what it said. And finally Dorothy told me what it said. It says, in hoc signa vincis, which is Scottish, which I probably just murdered. Translated, it is, in this sign thou wilt conquer. Now whether it has any significance to the tunnel, I don't know. Perhaps the fact that they conquered uh, this tremendous feat of putting a tunnel underneath the river, or perhaps it has nothing to do with that. thought it was interesting, though. She did say that uh, her grandfather suffered badly burnt hands from that rescue. But those burnt hands didn't stop him from being creative. I mean, if you notice in this uh, picture right here, you can see the St. Clair Tunnel with the floral design and arrangement. And in this picture you see even a, a better picture because it's in color. Well that's all Alex Forbes' work. Uh, he planted all those flowers in that design. So he was quite a talented man. And here he is looking quite distinguished. After this incident, it became clear to Grand Trunk Railroad officials, employees, and the like that electrification needed to happen, and quickly. And that's what we'll look at in our next video, the electrification of the St. Clair Tunnel. And we'll take a look at these new electric engines.